Well, we uh, started last time talking about repentance, and um, we're going down the list. Today we are talking about earnestness. You may recall, and uh, I'm not counting on you to recall, so we're going to look at it. <laughs> Second Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11 contain for us something quite useful, which is a list of the things that repentance is made of. The ingredients, if you will. Are you one of those people who reads the can or the box at the store? To see what ingredients are inside of it, perhaps. I'm not one of those people. And most of those words are not English. But in the case of repentance, I'm very interested in what is inside that because I would like that to be whole and complete and just right for us. In 2 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, we begin with, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. See what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, the church of Corinth, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment at every point you prove yourselves innocent in the matter. I always said last time how that the church there had quite a few things amiss, which you can read about in 1 Corinthians. If you look at that letter, the place was pretty crazy, not the kind of place where you would want to place membership, let's just say. However, the letter landed, and it made them sad, but it was the right kind of sadness. Judas was sad, too, but he went out and hanged himself. Peter was sad after having uh, betrayed the Lord, but he repented and became, well, what we know about the man Peter in the rest of the New Testament. Corinth had the same kind of sadness that Peter did. This world, uh, not worldly grief, but this godly sorrow that led to repentance. And these are the things that you're seeing. But the bottom line is, well, the bottom line there, at every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. That's what we want, is this thing is behind. It is repudiated. It is no more. How did they do that? Well, it is the things you read about there. You can see that earnestness was produced by the godly kind of grief in addition to indignation fear longing right there's an earnestness and eagerness to clear yourselves an indignation a fear a longing a zeal a punishment these are all things that make up repentance and so they're worth studying to see what are these things? Because, he said, at every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. If you want to be innocent of a thing that is in the past, if you want to say that used to be me, but that is not anymore, I have repented, then you need these things. That's what it means. So we ought to look at these things. What are they? Today we are looking at earnestness. Some of these uh, lessons, we might be able to get more than one, but not this one. Earnestness. And yes, I'm aware that everybody thinks about Ernest goes to camp when they sing Ernest in his vineyard. But no, earnestness is something else entirely. It is haste or speed. What it really means. Spudo, spude, speed. Uh haste, speed, uh, but it also means something like perhaps zeal or going to trouble, going to pains to get something done, to accomplish something, uh, exert an effort. But because of the haste or the speed with which you do a thing, or because of the trouble you're willing to go to or the effort you're willing to make, it also means earnestness or seriousness. You're taking this seriously. The Greek way of thinking about it is, if this actually matters to you, then you're doing it 
and you're doing it now and you're you're going to take the time you're going to go out of your way to do it and do it now that's what this word means it's all it also appears in several other forms and so they're worth looking at together we have a verb form for it which is you know if you do this to somebody you're setting them uh, going urging them on hastening them on their way but much more often it's just a thing that you yourself do not that you do to somebody else and in this case it would be you are pressing on or hastening the examples given where this kind of wording is used is warriors who are fighting obviously they are uh, in a hurry they are serious about this they are zealous about it if they're going to be fighting uh, a smith at work uh, which is still a cool thing if you ever go to the renaissance fair uh, pretty cool to see a smith at work and the effort that that takes beasts of draught which is the old english way of saying draft animals <laughs> animals working putting forth effort going to trouble or pains for you of course or bees working they are quite busy indeed but this is the meaning for being earnest if we are repentant then we have this kind of seal this kind of earnestness about us which is we're doing it in all seriousness and we're doing it now and, and you know it's a priority so in the new testament where this word or the base of the word appears that i thought was useful for this lesson include the following passages which make up the rest of the lesson today uh, one place is romans 12 verse 11 don't be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord so in romans 12 we're talking about not being conformed to the world but transforming ourselves by the renewal of the mind that is in the spirit of god we are living the gospel we are presenting our bodies as living sacrifice for god and he said don't be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord meaning you got to mean this uh, the the work of god is a serious matter and it should be treated seriously and you have to mean what you're doing and mean what you're saying uh, be earnest about this but also in this case not be slothful about it don't wait to do excuse me don't wait to do what you know is right or needs to be done the lord's things are always the most important things second uh, corinthians 8 verses 7 and 8 have another example of earnestness in this case he writes to the church in Corinth about the uh, the need that there is in Judea among the uh, apostles and the church that's there that there's a famine and people are are actually in need. The churches all around the Mediterranean are determined that they're going to send money to Jerusalem to help them obtain uh, what they need in this time of famine. And Paul writes to them here in Second Corinthians. 8 verses 7 through 8 as you excel in everything faith speech knowledge earnestness our love for you see to it that you excel in this act of grace also that is giving for the needy in Jerusalem I say this not as a command but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine well there's earnestness of others in uh, Jerusalem that the Apostles taught them and gave them the word and spread the gospel so they kind of owe that if you will they owe a, a physical you know remuneration for the spiritual benefit of the lord jesus that they have received by the word of the apostles on the one hand uh, on the other hand other greek city states have determined to give and i think in particular we would argue that he's talking about thessalonica who gave out of their poverty beyond their means to give it is recorded they were the ones who supported Paul when he preached in Greece nobody in Greece paid for Paul in his teaching Thessalonica did 
and they didn't do so because they were the wealthiest church in the region. They were the poorest church in the region. They did so because they had the most faith. So he writes to Corinth the same kind of thing. No, you don't have to give to Jerusalem. But Thessalonica gave to Jerusalem. What's your excuse? <laughs> That's all. Where's the earnestness? Where's the speed, the diligence? Do you see that you are at spiritual war? Are you taking it seriously like a war? That's what he's saying. Very reasonable. In Hebrews chapter 6, we have another example of this idea of earnestness. Where he says to them in 10, 11, and 12, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have already shown for his name and serving the saints, which you still do. We desire that each one of you shows the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You may or may not recall the context of Hebrews 6, but he's saying to them, a lot of people have become dull of hearing, sluggish of hearing. They don't understand the scriptures like they should. They don't know God like they should. It's time to mature or past time. They should have been mature by now, but they need to start over again. Well, not, not the way it's supposed to be. Not the way it should be. He said, look, you, you have done a lot in work and in love and in serving the saints, and you're still doing that, and God isn't going to forget about that service, first of all. But we want you to show the same earnestness so that you can have a full assurance of hope till the end, meaning you've got to finish this out. The past is good, and that's not going to be overlooked, but there's more to do. Don't be sluggish. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And there's a discussion already in Hebrews about those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. But, of course, the major, uh, I guess the major exhibit there is Hebrews 11. But all he's getting at is that they received promises. They heard from God, they who walked by faith in times before. And they had to take hold of that. And take action in the now, even though the promise wouldn't be fulfilled for a very long time, if at all, in their lifetime. So we also should be not sluggish, because they weren't. You see how uh, when God tests Abraham and says, you need to go offer your son Isaac, he gets up first thing in the morning and saddles the donkey and they go. When God says, get up and leave your country and your kinsmen to a place I will show you, he leaves in the morning. This is the way that they are by faith. They trusted God. They did what he said. They did it now. They were at war in the spirit. So we also are to imitate those who through faith and through patience inherit the promise. Faith in that we trust God that yes, what he says is true. And yes, there is benefit in this. It's worth doing. And patience in that we have to be strong and we have to stick it out for what seems like a long time, our lives, our lifetime. Uh, as we said, some of them didn't see the promises. They welcomed them from afar, knowing that there was coming a time when that would be fulfilled or have its fulfillment. We have to walk this way. But there's an earnestness about it. Because they really believed God that there was an afterlife and that what they were doing was worth it and the cost they were paying would be worth it. We have to do the same if we're going to be earnest. And this earnestness is a characteristic of repentance. They left things is what you're reading in Hebrews. They left their kinsmen. They left their countrymen. They, uh, you know, thought they were going to leave their lineage or whatever else might be happening. They did that for God and they did it immediately. That's how repentance is supposed to be. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, we have a couple of verses. The 17th one tells us 
they're sending a brother who is a gospel preacher. They said he accepted our appeal to go to you in Corinth. But being himself very earnest, he's going of his own accord. He wants to do this. We asked him to go. We appealed to him, but it was his own doing. He wanted to do this. And so there's some independence there. Initiative, they would call this in your managerial training. <laughs> Does the employee demonstrate initiative? While also not getting us sued, which is HR's primary purpose. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, we, we care about humans. I mean, people. Uh, they're not just resources, or, well, maybe they are. But anyway, this man is earnest in wanting to do this of his own, whether they appealed to him or not. He wanted to do it. There's initiative in that, right? The, the starting this up, he knew what was right. He knew what God wanted. He took it upon himself. So there's some ownership here. There's initiative, as we say, but, but there's, you can see how this is like repentance and why those are related. The 22nd verse also, we're sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. Aha, so somebody here who is also preaching is headed to Corinth because of what they have done, repenting into conformity of the teaching in that first letter, 1 Corinthians. It says, we've often tested him and found him earnest in many matters. And he's now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. So he's going. There's no stopping him. But it's interesting to me that they're tested and found to be earnest. And there's something about this that does relate quite well to repentance that when we leave a thing behind, we leave it, but we may still be tested. There needs to be a time where we show or demonstrate that that is behind. It is gone. It is no more. Uh, perhaps, if not to others, to ourselves. We need to know that, yep, I beat that and I'm not going back to that. This one is enthusiastic because of the repentance at Corinth. And I think that that's true. Repentance is contagious. When you are trying to be right with God and trying to clear yourself of the wrongs of the past, then you are naturally drawn to others who are also trying to be right with God and clear themselves of the wrongs of the past. We are brethren. So it's like that. Now, 2 Timothy 2 is the next spot that we have. Here we look at a different aspect of earnestness, which is that speed, that uh, seriousness, that diligence. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, this is the word that is used there. Uh, some say... Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved. Some say, yeah, do your best, as this one does. I know the King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Um, and that has been misunderstood as Bible study. Not that Bible study is bad. Um, it's good. And it does help you to be approved before God. That's true. But that's not what the passage is saying. The passage is talking about earnestness, uh, zeal, the effort here. Expend the effort. Be real about this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. This is saying that we make an external, if you will, an objective third party the standard. The way we are being measured, we're presenting ourselves to God. As one approved. Meaning, if God approves of us, then we're good. We're not seeking the approval of men. We're not seeking the approval, uh, you know, of peers, of those around us. We're trying to be presented to God directly. And as he said, do your best. 
Make every effort. Which is something like, we know we're going to be judged for everything done in the body, whether it is good or whether it is evil. You do not want to wait until the judgment day to think about this, to put yourself to the test and see how you measure up to the standard of God in the Bible. You don't want to wait until then. Surprises are not good on the day of judgment. You want to test yourself now. You want to apply yourself now. Compare yourself in the law of liberty. Look into the mirror that is God's word to see what needs to be corrected. Do it now before it's too late. If the judgment day is too late to see everything clearly, you need to see it clearly now so that you can repent, so you can make things right with God, so you can be approved by him and have no need to be ashamed and handle correctly the word of truth. That's the meaning here. So there's a lot there to do with repentance, I think. That transfers very nicely. We also have Hebrews 4, 11. There is a rest remaining for the people of God, according to David, who writes in the psalm that there was a rest. Let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience as those of old had done. See also 1 Corinthians 10. But um, it's fairly clear that there is a rest remaining, and not everybody who came out of Egypt went into the promised land. With many of them, God was not pleased, and their bodies fell. We should strive, therefore, to enter that rest, so that we may not fall by the same sort of disobedience. Again, First Corinthians 10, first half of that chapter is about this. That's yeah, probably more than first half, but you get the idea. They were saved, if you will, from Egypt, but they didn't get to the promised land. They fell. He's saying to us, there is a rest, and that rest remains. It wasn't given to them by Moses. We must strive so that we do not fall. A certain um, humility about this that we're always working. And we know, of course, they say while there's life, there is hope. And that's true. But it's also true that while there's life, there is danger. <laughs> you never just uh, punch the ticket and glide all the way to heaven. It's not like that. The devil is always there. I will say this. Um, especially in light of uh, Malcolm's earlier remarks uh, that I did have a chance to talk to, uh, to talk to Mike yesterday and, and um, my chancellor that is. And, um, you know, uh, it's true. He's facing a lot of very hard things, but the thing that really caught my attention with him was how he did not see the ticket punched. He said, you know, I, I can't always get out. I uh, can't always sit. They won't, you know, I mean, they've made a seat for me that's very comfortable and I try to go most of the time, you know. And uh, he said, I don't always, you know, I can't always remember what I just heard or read, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, I'm just praying to God that I could be useful somehow, that what I'm doing is useful to them. And that what I'm praying for is what I should be praying for. Uh, and that, you know, my frustration and my anger with the things that are happening here don't overcome me. And I was thinking, this is incredible. This man is, uh, by many accounts, not, you know, not sure where he is at the time. Um, and who is, you know, clearly suffering in the flesh is nonetheless spending his waking time praying. He listens to sermons. He listens to classes. He's, he has the Bible read to him by his tablet. <laughs> That's what he's spending his time doing and praying. He's so earnest about it. And I will comment on it because, you know, he's, well, he's not here. Um, and that's okay. We can get away with saying nice things about people when they're not here. 
but because I think it fits this, like this strive to enter that rest that no one may fall. That whole idea of yeah, there's no there's no sailing, there's no sliding in. I, I would have considered, you know, you're asking me about this fellow who has served faithfully as an elder and has done a lot of things in the faith. Is you know brought up children the way that they were supposed to be brought up. And, you know, you're asking me, I'm saying I'm confident that this man has his, a reward from God coming. And, and yet to hear him talk, he hopes that he's still doing the right thing from the place where you would think he can't do anything. But no, that's not true. He can pray. He can know what to pray for. He can study. He can answer questions, right? There's a lot of stuff happening there. It just made me think about it. Like that is striving to enter. <laughs> that is not giving up ever. Never give up. So that was, I thought that was pretty cool. I like that guy. <laughs> Second Peter chapter one. Very similar. Verse 10 said, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You might be familiar with the passage. If not, it's a good study. But the passage presents to us a, um, oh, I dropped the word. It's a, a sequence, a sequence of growth, how a person grows in the spirit. And it's not like you spend, you know, the first part of your life in this part and, and, you know, by the end of life, hopefully you got to the last step. It's a repetitive process. This is how you move from, you know, immaturity to having uh, achieved something. That's what Peter's talking about. And he said, be diligent about this. Confirm that calling and that election. Meaning you heard the word. That's good. Or at least we think that you heard it. We think that it pricked uh, your heart within you. And you were elected, meaning you obeyed the gospel. You were baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. That means you're elected. You're chosen. Selected is really the word there, not elected. But selected. Be all the more diligent to confirm that. If you practice these qualities, you'll never fall. Practice meaning repetition. It's Time and again, we, we move in this way. That's how you mature in the spirit. Over and again, as long as there is life. But there is that be all the more diligent. We have to keep going and not fall asleep. Finally, 2 Peter 3.14. In the end, of course, the Lord is going to return. And there is going to be a day of judgment. And this world is going to cease. Everything in it burned up. What persons ought we to be? Knowing that everything will be taken away. And that's what he says. 2 Peter 3.14 Beloved, since you are waiting for all these things to happen, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be diligent to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, that's earnestness. Do you really intend to be innocent when the Lord comes? Are you really holding yourself back from what is wrong, what you know is a shameful thing or not something the Lord would go with? How earnest are you? How diligent are you? These are the measures of repentance, at least as far as earnestness is concerned. And there are quite a few additional terms on the list that we will look at the Lord willing at another opportunity. Today, if you are not yet a child of God, not yet a Christian, become a child of God that you might have forgiveness of sins. There is an earnestness and a zeal. There is a do it now because, well, we don't know how long we live. We don't know when our time is. We don't know when the Lord comes back. We don't know when the devil swoops in and takes the seed away. We what was clear or what was right, we become immune to or uh, just don't feel it anymore. So, yeah, there's only danger in delay. Doing the right thing must be at this time. 
today, uh, if you are not a Christian, we will help you to obey the gospel of Jesus very gladly and encourage you to do so. If you are already a Christian and have not lived right, repent, make things right with God in the heart, pray for forgiveness. We will pray with you too if that is uh, desired. None of us has got this in the bag. We all need Jesus. We all need forgiveness. And uh, we can strengthen one another and remind one another. So if today you need to obey the gospel or if you need the prayers of the saints, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. 